Hey, how's everybody doing? You lazy bastards in America finally waking up? Over here in England, been up for hours. So is anything uh, new and exciting happening since, <laughs> since I flew to England? Uh, over here it is 3.21 p.m. Sorry, I made you wait. <laughs> so I don't have a uh, coffee. Well, actually, I think there might be a coffee maker. No, there's no coffee maker. Damn it. So I did not watch the Pence Kane debate, but I've been reading all the uh, the reactions to it, and I guess I don't have to watch it since obviously, uh, yeah, even even the. Uh, Clinton supporters seem to think that Pence won. So really, the uh, the big question is, is uh, does it matter, right? You know, who cares what the vice presidents do, right? But uh, there's really something uh, something different about this time because we've never had two candidates that are both this old at the same time. Uh, and we've never had a situation where there's a candidate whose uh, ability to actually survive the office is actually a major topic of conversation. Um, so if the vice president ever mattered, like if, if once in the history of the United States the vice president pick mattered, this would have to be the year, right? Just because of the age of the candidates. And I, I've got a feeling, yeah, there have been times when one candidate was old, and you could argue that that, you know, that was a half as um, good a reason as now. <laughs> so, yeah, he won big. So I don't, I don't think it makes um, too much of a difference normally, but this year might be the exception. Now, the other thing that's interesting is that this year more than any other year. I can't, I can't remember when I've ever heard this be a topic of conversation, but the idea is that some, that, uh, you know, there's one of the criticisms of Trump is that he can't surround himself with the, the best advisors. And part of the evidence given for that is that he's gone through a few uh, campaign managers before getting Kellyanne, who's doing a great job. So, uh, but let me give you a different perspective on this. Let me just put a little different filter on it. If you're if you're putting the voter filter on it, you look at Trump and you say, "What the hell? He must be bad at hiring people because he had that Corey Lewandowski, and then he fired him, and then he then he got Paul Manafort, and he fired him, and you know now he's got uh, Kellyanne uh, Conway, yeah, working for him now." So if you were just look at it. As a voter, you would say to yourself, what the heck? He must be terrible at hiring people because he has to keep firing them. But let me, let me give you the perspective of um, literally the smartest person I know who's also an entrepreneur. You know, somebody who, somebody who knows startups specifically better than anybody you'll probably ever meet. And I once asked him the secret of his success, and I'll... I'll uh, keep his name private because I don't know how well I'm going to uh, <laughs> represent his point of view. So, so let me say that uh, if, he, if he wants me to talk about it, I will. Um, what he said was that uh, hiring is hard, you know, to do it right, but that has more to do with finding the right people. It's, it's more about just, you know, how do you, how do you get the right people to walk into your office in the first place? You know, what do you do to attract them? So that's a different kind of skill. If you're the president of the United States, you know, that part's already done for you. And if you're Donald Trump, that part has probably already been done for you for years. People look, you know, they apply for the job. So you've got all these qualified people to choose from, right? So the biggest problem of hiring is just finding qualified people. But that's sort of solved for you if you're the president or if you're a billionaire like Donald Trump. The good people all come to you. But then the second part is that even the good people sometimes are the wrong fit for a certain culture, a certain boss, certain situation, certain point in time. 
Um, I would argue that Lewandowski was probably the right person for Trump in the very beginning when he seemed he had no no chance and they just had this really scrappy combative style to you know get a lot of headlines. But once they needed to get a little bit more serious and manage the convention, Lewandowski wasn't the right guy. So again, it wasn't th it wasn't that there was anything wrong with Lewandowski because he, obviously he's highly capable, but he wasn't the right fit anymore because the situation changed. Got rid of him. Bam. Decisive. All right. Now, he gets Manafort. Manafort is known as a you know a great operator, get things back in shape, um, and get you through the convention. Perfect person for that. What happened? Manafort did a great job. Got him through the convention. Now, at some point, he decided that Manafort was no longer the right fit. We don't know the details, but at some point, he decided he wasn't. Now, we don't know how, how good of a fit Manafort was, but almost everybody is saying that the person he replaced Manafort with is better for this phase of the uh, operation, which is now again different. Now he's got to put a, now he's got to move to the center and he's got to, you know, put a sort of a, you know, nuance to his policies and all that stuff. He's got to stay out of trouble for a while. So Kellyanne seems to be the right person for that. So if you didn't know anything about business and you were just a voter and you looked on, you'd say three campaign managers and in, 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 you know, just a matter of months. What the hell? He must be terrible at hiring people. However, if you're literally the smartest entrepreneur I've ever met, or really anybody who's experienced the business is going to agree with what I'm going to say now. Um, the fact that he hired the right people at the right phase and 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 clinically just decapitated them the moment when he didn't need them for the next phase is about as good as you can get at firing. And it turns out that firing is a more important skill if you're in a position like the President of the United States or... Um, uh, or Donald Trump, because they have no trouble attracting lots of people who look great on paper, but you don't really know, you know, who's going to be good and who's going to be a perfect fit at this phase of the company, at this phase of the election with this particular person, right? Nobody's smart enough to know that. So it turns out the hiring is really about narrowing it down to, you know, a smaller herd that are all pretty qualified. But that's as far as you can get with being a good hirer, right? The rest is just luck. All right, and you can't manage luck at that level. But if you're also a good firer, someone who can get rid of somebody clinically and kindly and efficiently when you need to, then you can try another person from the small pool of people that you have available to you. And, that, and the next thing you know, you have much better odds. It's a system, not a goal. All right. And remember, this is, um, if you read my book, How to Failed Almost Everything and Still Win Big, I talk about systems versus goals. A goal-oriented process would be to try to pick the one best person to be your campaign manager, and then you just keep that person no matter what, because your goal is to pick the, the best one, and you, know, you probably think you did. But if you're a systems kind of a thinker, which is far more efficient, I think, you might say it's a process of hiring and then firing, that the firing is part of the process. You can't you can't separate it because if you fire well and you fire quickly, you you double, triple, quadruple your odds of finding even just by chance the best one of your small pool of people. So, um, as is often the case with the selection, the people who know the least come to a different uh, opinion than the people who know the most about business. You saw the same thing with the with with Trump's taxes where the people who knew the least said some version of, hey, he's not paying enough taxes. And then that was sort of the end of their cognition. It's like, did somebody say he, he he's not paying taxes and he's a billionaire now? You know, never mind that nobody ever lost money intentionally at that level. Like nobody ever said to themselves, hey, I'm going to try this uh, cool dodge to get out of paying taxes. I'm going to lose a shitload of money. Like not actually just lose it on paper, I'm actually going to fucking lose it. I'm going to lose a billion dollars. Nobody does that, all right? So, so the first of all, you got to know that nobody does it intentionally. But if you can make it back, that's pretty impressive. It means you can persuade, you can negotiate, and those are the things he's trying to sell. 
Um, and by the way, most entrepreneurs who succeed have had a bunch of failures in the past. I can say that because I literally wrote the book on it. It's called How to Fail at Almost Everything and Still Win Big. So the people who have failed tend to, tend to be the ones who are most qualified. Yeah. Because they, they, they simply learn more. Why are you in London? <laughs> um, I'm in London for a vacation. And to see London. Didn't deny that she said that to Assange. You know, if I'm being objective, the whole uh, Hillary going to drone Assange is the same thing that we complain about on the Trump side. It's something taken out of context. Um, and one of it is, uh, and yeah, the context is that things look different when you read them in a transcript than they do when you're saying it. Um, so whether or not she actually said, can we drone him? Here's what I think it was far more likely if she did say it. She may have used drone him as, um, you know, sort of a catch-all for, <laughs> you know, killing him. Um, but don't you think it was completely responsible to put that question out there? Because remember, well, I don't think he should be droned. You know, that's my personal opinion. The opinion of the government is that they were dealing with you know, a national security risk of the top order. Now, we might say that the real risk was to their, you know, their own livelihoods and careers, but probably there were some, you know, legitimate, you know, national interests involved too. I'm no expert on the, on the WikiLeaks, but imagine if that's what they thought. If you're sitting in a room with a bunch of people who have decided, and by the way, it was their job to decide this stuff, that he was literally, you know, um, you know, the, <laughs> a, a huge, almost a terrorist level risk to the United States. Mm, can't be too surprised if they talked about killing him. And, you know, I, I have a much softer stance about talking about things, even if all you're doing is raising it so you can eliminate it. Now, obviously, she raised it, whether it was joking or not, and it was never taken seriously, which is what you would want in that situation. But can you really blame her for raising it? That's sort of like blaming, you know, Trump for, um, you know, every little thing he says that offends somebody. So Sunday's the next debate, right? Well, you know, I think everybody's making the same... Uh, <laughs> I, I'm actually thinking about stopping by the Ecuadorian embassy. Um, to do exactly that, or at least just take a picture of it. You know, I'll probably get arrested for taking a picture of an embassy. Uh, but a public street, hmm. You know, I didn't, actually, I probably won't get arrested because it's a public street. But the weird thing is that if I take a picture of the embassy, you know they're taking a picture of me back, which is kind of creepy. You know, like guaranteed they have cameras on the uh, the street. So... Are you going to debate a Hyde Park Speaker's Corner? Now, that would be interesting. I wonder what's involved in that. Do you just have to go up and just show up? Kane referred to himself as gender neutral. Uh, I didn't hear about that. Oh, predictions. So the prediction is... Um, that Trump will do better, which everybody's predicting because he didn't do so well the first time. So it, it, it would be shocking if he did worse. It wouldn't be totally shocking if he did, you know, roughly the same or, you know, he slipped up in a few other ways that seemed somehow equivalent to this time. Um, but I, I think you should expect, you know, improvements. Oh, right-hand person. Keenan was asked about his positions. Literally mentioned missionary. What? By the way, um, someone mentioned this on Twitter today, and I, I wouldn't have mentioned it except someone else did, and that, that means someone else saw it too. But Tim Kane, if he keeps losing his hair in the middle, 
he is going to be the pointy-haired boss. Like you can imagine casting him in the in the movie treatment of of Dilbert. Am I wrong? <laughs> you should buy um, How to Fail at almost everything and still win big first. <laughs> ZZ. Yeah. Well, my tea. So, true story. I uh, I ordered a lemonade yesterday at dinner here in uh, London, and they brought me. Uh, I think it was like a like a diet Seven Up. <laughs> it had some kind of like lime flavor in it, but it was basically just soda. Christina is doing her own thing right now. <laughs> Did you get any jet lag? I slept pretty well in the plane, so a little bit, but not the worst thing in the world. I got to sleep in a little bit. Black pudding. Good Lord. Oh, lemonade is Sprite. <laughs> so it was let... Oh, so it literally was Sprite. Okay. So have you noticed, I've noticed that everything over here, it feels like you could make up the name of a street without knowing anything. You know, like if, if I were going to make up a street, it would be Batten, Battington's Way, or uh, <laughs> they'll have those, those strange Harry Potter names, which of course is not a coincidence. <laughs> it's like Coke in the South. Yeah, there was a it was sort of a bed plane on the Yeah, I didn't I didn't use the bed part, but they had one. Gonna meet with anyone famous. Um not that I know of. Persuasion in England compared to the US? It's a good question. I'd have to spend a lot of time here to know if there is any difference. I don't know if there is. Uh, well, I've only been here you know, less than a full day, counting yesterday. So, so far I've just seen, just walked around and seen the sights. Trump's still winning? Well, not according to the polls. <laughs> So I went to the aquarium, and uh, it was kind of cool. The London Eye. So true story. I went to uh, to try to take one of the you know the ferry boats for a little uh, tour. You know they can they go down the river here, and there are all kinds of options. But the signs were so confusing that I thought, oh, you know, I'm just going to have to ask at the ticket at the ticket counter for which one I should get. And I go up there and I realize that the entire time I've been here, I haven't understood one freaking thing that anybody has said to me if they're a native. I don't understand anything of the language. And it's not, here's the funny part, it's not because I can't understand you know, a British accent, although they have them, obviously. It's that they talk softly compared to Americans. And apparently, you know, maybe I've I've already lost my hearing somewhat because when I talk to an American, they say, hello, how are you? And you, know, you can hear him from a block away. I never have trouble hearing Americans. Well, I mean, most of them. But over here, everybody's, everybody's a little bit polite. How are you, sir? Very good to hear you. And I swear to God, I couldn't understand a word she was saying. Something about, and then, and then her answer to me was, well, if you go to up to Ipswich and you take a right at the Wimbledon, but you could go to the number three, number three to take you toward the Paddington Way, uh, take a left at the Whitmore, and in th 15 minutes, and none of it made any sense to me. And, and it was all mumbled, so I was only catching every third word anyway. So I actually had to bail out on taking the, the ferry. I mean, while I was just standing right there, it was, it was indecipherable because apparently I'm in a country where they don't speak my language. I, I don't really understand mumble. 
That's why we have the reputation of being loud and brash. But damn it, you can hear us. <laughs> get recognized? No, I'm not going to get recognized here. Well, hello from Southampton. I do miss my dog. Beg your pardon. Can you say that again? I'm trying to work on my accent. What's your diet? So far, French fries, which apparently they call chips. How's the food? <laughs> you know, I, I had heard that, that the food in England is flavorless unless you're eating some of the, the ethnic restaurant food. Um, but, oh dear God, I had, <laughs> I had the blandest I've had the blandest food here. It's almost inedible. Like I, I'm gonna lose a, I'm gonna lose ten pounds <laughs> if I stay here much longer. It's just, it's just awful. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> I had two bites of my dinner last night, and I was like, oh, get me out of here. That was at a pretty high end restaurant. Yeah, looks like Indian food is the way to go. I didn't catch the debate. I was talking about the debate a little earlier. Yeah, I hear Italy's a better deal. You know, there's tons of people jogging uh, in the streets in the evening. It looks like people put their little backpack on and stick their business clothes in there and uh, jog to work or jog home, I mean. Where is Abbey Road Studios? On Abbey Road? I was actually thinking about that. Somebody from uh, from London on here to tell me how far Abbey Road is from the the embankment area. <laughs> so um, I hear there was a lot of interrupting. <laughs> It's near St. John's Wood. Okay, well. Uh, creepy cane. <laughs> so, I've noticed that um, the, the physical uh, vibe of the candidates is having an unusually big effect this year. Maybe bigger than it's ever. Because uh, the people who hate Trump hate the way he looks. They can't stand to look at him or hear him. It's like, just, it's just a visceral thing. But likewise, the people who don't like Clinton and the people who don't like Kane. Um, and probably, probably the same with Pence, except he's the most vanilla guy. So I've got a, I've got a feeling that nobody's really totally creeped out by Pence. Um, the Grinch. <laughs> uh, I, I saw him uh, there was a meme where Kane was compared to Clem Cadiddlehopper. And if you know who that is, you're very old, but it was a funny picture. Yeah, what are, what are the odds that Pence would look like Race Bannon when Bannon is important to the race and race is important to the race? What are the odds? Jack Nicholson's Joker. <laughs> Uh, the election will be decided on Sunday's debate. Yeah, no. I mean, I can't imagine it will be such a knockout um, because there's one debate left. I think people will sort of keep their powder dry. I mean, it's possible, but I don't think that's the most uh, likely. The, the Corinthian Hotel is right across the street. Uh, mm, you were right about Wiki WikiLeaks again. I was right that they have nothing. You mean? <laughs> um, we don't know what WikiLeaks had, right? They just uh, haven't. They just delayed. Is there any news on that, or is WikiLeaks just going to give up and say they don't really have anything? Yep, they gave up, or yep, 
they said something. Pending. They had nothing. Yeah, if they had something, they would have released it. So what about that, uh, the Guccifer hack, <laughs> where, where there's an actual file that says pay to play? <laughs> So this is, again, uh, only useful to the low information voters. And you know, many of you may fall into that category in this particular case. Um, you know, I'm saying limited to this case. So if you haven't been around big corporations with corporate lawyers, and if you didn't have experience with that, and you just saw that there was a file on somebody's server that said pay to play and they're politicians, you would think, oh my God, that's a file where they keep all the bribes stuff. <laughs> And I'm sure people are going to think that. But here's how it lawyers think, uh, corporate lawyers and lawyers in general. There were no doubt unsolicited letters coming in from people saying, hey, I'll give you some money, but, you know, coincidentally, I'd like you to approve a bill or appoint me to something. Or, and maybe, maybe they were direct about it, and maybe it was just in the same letter, which is direct enough. If you're a lawyer, you know that's illegal. Yeah, and certainly embarrassing if you got caught. Um, so what you would do is you would tell people to put them all in one place so that they could come up with a coherent policy for how to deal with these letters and maybe still get money out of these people, but stay on the right side of the, the law about it. In other words, to avoid pay for play. <laughs> so the most, you know, my, my first take on it was that it was probably a hoax because it was too on the nose, it's a Hollywood term. Uh, on the nose means it's just, you know, too exactly what you're expecting. Like you expect to, let's hack her and there it is. There's a file called pay to play where we put all of our illegal activities. Uh, that's so ridiculous. You know, even if you assume stupidity and I realize that the, the top reason to, you know, the number one hypothesis in any situation is that somebody was stupid. Yeah, I get that, but, but it would be really weirdly stupid for them to have a file to collect all their illegal things you know, in a server so you can find them and have your tech guy, you know, in charge of making the file structure probably or, or supporting it, you know, as if the tech guy should have access to an entire file of their illegal activities and nothing could go wrong with that, right? He's probably a contractor. He's not even a government employee, you know, unless they kill him immediately and then kill everybody who replaces him forever. You're not going to have the tech guy have access to a file of all your illegal dealings, you know, no matter how much you trust them. It's, it's ridiculous to think that that pay for play file is literally a pay for play repository. It is far more likely that the lawyer said, put them all in one place. So when we deal with them, we can be consistent about how we treat them to avoid any pay for play, even um, to avoid even the appearance of it. But yet they still want their money. So there's probably a way to say, look, you know, there may, you can imagine that the process is this. Put all of those letters in a file. Make sure that when you respond, you run it by the lawyer. Okay, that would be a process. Always run it by the lawyer if it's this type of letter. And say to them some version of, we can't offer you anything um, in conjunction with, or even in the same conversation with, your, your donation. But we would really like your donation because we can help a lot of people. All right. So that would be a system and that would be a perfectly legitimate reason to put it in a folder that says pay to play. So I don't think that's anything. So the that doesn't mean people won't imagine it's something. And it doesn't mean that, you know, Trump can't use it. I mean, all he has to do is say you had an actual file that said pay to play right on your server. And all the people who are who have never worked in a big corporation, never dealt with a lawyer, are going to look at that and say, my God, it's proof, proof of their bribery. Now, I happen to think they're up to something. You know, I, I'm sure there is some pay to play there. There's just too much smoke. Uh, but I doubt that file has, you know, that, that file is probably exactly an attempt to remove even the appearance of pay to play because it came from the lawyer, right? The lawyer is probably not in on it. You know, if, if there's any kind of pay to play, it's something that happens in private conversations between, you know, just the, the top people. If even the lawyer, the lawyer wouldn't want to know that, right? The lawyer would, you know, if you even started to tell a lawyer that you were going to do something that was pay for play, the lawyer would stop you halfway through the sentence. 
again, if you've ever had any experience with a lawyer, you know this is true. As soon as you start to tell them something illegal, they go, up, oh, up. Oh, it's better I don't know that. Uh, would like to see Hillary get paid to work for once. <laughs> Uh, uh, I saw the ad with, yeah. You know, that it's funny, that was another thing that Trump went so easy on, was the, why aren't you up by 50 points? Because he just made this sort of vague reference to it that I don't think most people have been connected to the event. You know, it's, he said you, you did a certain thing at a certain event. Uh, what he probably just should have done an, an impression or or in, encourage people watching the debate to go look it up on YouTube. Just say, look, if you're watching this debate, just go Google, why am I not up by 50 points already? Or whatever the quote is. And say, you're going to find, and then, then just watch it. If after watching that, you think that Clinton is 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 fit, is capable to run the country, then I would, then I think you should take a look at our policy differences. But if you can look at that and think that she is okay, then I would be surprised. I mean, imagine saying that. Every single person watching the debate would pull out a smartphone or a laptop and turn to that you know, YouTube file. It would blow up the internet. But he would have people looking at that and saying, before you even think about our policies, Question number one is, is she okay? And you, you need to look at that too. Uh... <laughs> uh, Kane knows, knows who wears the pantsuit. Uh, oh God, I don't want to laugh at all these types of jokes, but, <laughs> but I can't, I, I can't help it. Sometimes they're funny. I've said this before and I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that this is just, well, I don't know. I think I'm going to go out on a limb and say that the Trump supporters just seem to be funnier. Their memes are funnier, their jokes are funnier, their political ads are funnier. And I don't know. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know if it's just because people who uh, like their candidate think their candidate is funny or all the memes about their can that support their candidate or the funny ones. I can't tell, but it genuinely seems, and I'm trying to be objective here, but it really does seem like all the funny people are on one side. And I'm not really sure why that is. I think it, it might have to do with political correctness, you know, clearly being on more one side than the other. Liberals have no sense of humor. It's funny because it's not that they aren't mean enough. They're just mean in a different way. And by the way, thanks for the invitation in Zurich. Uh, comedians can't work because of PC. Well, it's still probably probably works for Seinfeld because he always was sort of PG rated anyway. The New York Times called Trump a terrorist? In what context? All right, anybody have any questions that don't involve my my personal life? Uh, does Hillary have more nicknames than anyone in the world? Let's see how many nicknames um, let, let you do the work. I want you to say as many uh, Hillary Clinton nicknames as you can think of. Just just go. All right, we're doing Hillary Clinton nicknames. Shillery. Crooked. <laughs> crooked, crooked. Pantsuit. Uh, Hillary, Hillary. Pantsuit, Hill Beast. Rotten. <laughs> Hillary, <laughs> Hillary, Satan, the cattle trader, the killery, healed beast, heal dog, <laughs> heartless. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, and then there's a whole genre of just her illnesses, right? There's a there's collapse in Clinton and Hillary and uh, sick Hillary. Don't forget sick Hillary. That one that one's been a big one. All right, now you're just getting mean. So, so I was talking about the ones that you've actually heard. All right, now let's do the same thing with Trump. And I'll tell you that um, beforehand, the only one I've heard is the one where they make fun of his original spelling of his name from you know the family that came from Austria. So it's Drumpf. So what if you heard about, yeah, besides Drumpf, <laughs> mentally ill. Uh, yeah, so Trump basically, oh, daddy, that's true. Clown's not really a nickname. Hitler's not really a nickname. Those are more just insults. Cheeto Jesus, that's a good one. Uh, Lance, they don't really call him that. Uh, <laughs> God Emperor. Yeah, I have heard that, actually. <laughs> yeah, it's funny, even... Uh, even the um, the insults for Trump are like weirdly positive, because uh, Cheeto Jesus actually has the you know Jesus name right in there, and who doesn't like Cheetos? So even Cheetos Jesus is sort of a little bit of a compliment. Daddy, kind of a compliment. Drumpf doesn't really mean anything. Doesn't mean anything. So you know, it's neither good nor no bad. The orange one. Yeah, you don't hear that, really. Um, and then, you know, Lord Emperor or President. Here's, a, here's one that you hear all the time as a nickname for Donald Trump. President Trump. Seriously. Uh, Teflon, uh, yeah, you've heard it as a descriptor. I haven't really heard it said of him. But think about that. Um, all of the Clinton nicknames that you can think of are negative. But the... <laughs> But the Trump nicknames that we came up with, and remember, both sides get to create nicknames. You know, it's not one side coming up with nicknames. I mean, it's, that's a little bit telling, isn't it? <laughs> that even Cheeto Jesus is two things you like put together, Cheetos and Jesus. Um, <laughs> you know, Daddy, Emperor. You know, the the insults are bad and worse. You know, calling him Hitler is obviously worse than Crooked. Prima Donald. <laughs> it's not that one side sticks. Yeah, you know, there may be something to that. But what does it tell you that one person has only negative nicknames and the other one has also nicknames, but they're, they're kind of weirdly positive, like President Trump. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, literally Hitler. Actually, I, I guess you could call that. Uh, I don't think Hitler is his nickname, but literally Hitler. But people do that. You, you say say that so much about him, you could almost call that a nickname. <laughs> All right. Does anybody have any questions? Otherwise, I think I've done what I need to do here. <laughs> My duper Trump. <laughs> Air viewer. <laughs> okay. I will give you the Hair Fewer <laughs> and Cheeto Jesus are pretty darn funny. <laughs> but I don't think Hair, hair Fewer has uh, caught on. That, that is really funny. <laughs> uh, Charlotte on South Bank. What's that? Chris Kelly, what's he? Do? What do you do? <laughs> um, oh, short-fingered vulgarian, yeah. Although that that was more of a descriptor. Two percent. Clinton wins. Tell us that scenario. Well, that's the scenario where anything could happen. Yeah, you know, it's just two percent to have a catch-all. And by the way, if Trump doesn't win, I'm going to say, I didn't guarantee it. There was a solid 2% chance he wasn't going to. Christina is at Starbucks, by the way. Just downstairs. Uh, where are you?
we're doing today. I don't know. There's a Salvador Dali Museum. I was just, I was literally just over there by the eye. I didn't see that. <laughs> Are you reconsidering your forecast? I am not. 98% chance. Oh my God, I just got bit by something. That's not good. What the hell kind of hotel room is this? Um, what will the popular vote be? I don't know. Close majority. Close majority. Is that good? Where Where is the Natural History Museum? Well, I guess I could Google that. That's not a bad idea. I give speech on speeches on the well. At the moment, I don't give any because since I've been writing about Trump. Uh, uh, all my speaking has the, the little bit I had got canceled. <laughs> um, but I speak on the topic of my book, had it failed almost everything and still went back. You could just Google me or actually go to YouTube and um, search for my name and speaking and you'll see some, some early versions of that talk. It got a lot better after that. Trafalgar Square. I should go there. Buckingham Palace. Yeah, maybe so. South Kensington. Maybe I will do that. I got blacklisted. Go to a chippy. What's a chippy? <laughs> well, if he had to steal a book, I'm glad it was mine. A persuasion wizard list. Hmm. All right, so I guess um, I'm going to take off and <laughs> and you people have a good day. Bye.